So, good afternoon and welcome to the fourth session of This is Film, Film Heritage in, in Practice. Sorry, I forgot the title. <laughs> My name is Giovanna Fossati. I'm the chief curator of iFilm Museum and a professor uh, Film Heritage and Digital Film Culture at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, this is Film is a collaboration started in 2015 between I Film Museum, the university, and uh, uh, the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis. Uh, this series is carried out with the master students of the This is Film class at the university, and this year we have uh, 31 students who help introducing our guests and asking them questions. The sessions are recorded and they will be made available on the um, iFilm Museum uh, YouTube channel uh, within a few weeks. Uh, and there you can also find um, recorded sessions from uh, 2021 and 2022. This year, uh, this is film addresses the overarching topic of activating the archive, which is also the theme of the eighth uh, I International Conference, which will uh, take place here in I Film Museum uh, between uh, the 4th and the 7th of June. Uh, in that occasion, we'll have approximately 60 speakers from around the world focusing on how audiovisual archives can promote the engagement with uh, specific social and political causes or support the efforts of activists or be used as communal resources uh, through global and local collaborations from inside and outside uh, archives. If you are interested, uh, the complete program will be published soon. With, uh, with this is film, we try to share with the students and the audience what happens behind the screens of a film archive as we feel that activities and discussions regarding film heritage are still quite unknown uh, outside the professional field. Whereas what happens with other cultural and uh, art objects, uh, such as paintings, sculptures, monuments, and so forth, is widely discussed within the public arena, uh, how films are collected, preserved, restored, and presented uh, in cinemas and online is not often shared with the general public. One of the biggest topics emerging within the field at the moment is the question regarding heritage institutions' colonial past, a, move, a movement often referred to as decolonizing archives. In this brief talk, I would like to give a simple introduction to what decolonizing film archives means and touch upon the related concept of restitution and repatriation of film heritage, which will be central to the uh, session uh, today. The idea that it is important and necessary to decolonize archives and museums in general moves from the premise that cultural and art heritage, in particularly in Europe and North America, has been traditionally established from the pers perspective of the powerful, or in colonial terms, the colonizers. Evident, evident examples are the objects preserved by European and North American museums that have been taken away from their original uh, sites in colonized countries. Indeed, the so-called restitution or repatriation of such uh, objects is considered one step in the decolonization process. But how can we translate the discussion about restitution or repatriation to film heritage? In most cases, uh, European audiovisual archives uh, don't hold films uh, that have been literally taken away or stolen from colonized countries. The translation of this term to, audio to the audiovisual field is indeed more co complex and subtle. 
Perhaps uh, this is why the discussion around the decolonization of film archives has started only recently and much later as compared to other archival and museum fields. However, this discussion is quickly becoming central to the work of film archives, film museums, and film festivals, as well as in the research and teaching activities of film scholars. For the sake of time, I would like to mention just a few examples of areas within the scope of film heritage in which the issue of restitution or repatriation needs to be addressed. One example is that of films made by colonizers in colonized countries. On the screen, we see a frame of the 1917 uh, film Never Heid by the Karo Bataks, held at I Film Museum, in which uh, Karo Batak people in Indonesia are portrayed while demonstrating their crafting skills. In this case, the issues at hand are about representation and who has the right to show and use these films that feature the local population without their explicit consent and usually as uh, servants or laborers. These images are often created as propaganda and always from the colonizer's perspective. So how can audiovisual archives confront this violent history and give a voice to those portrayed in these images? In the second session of This is Film, we have addressed some of these questions uh, with our guests, Amal Alach, um, Barbie Asanti, and Jefta Patikawa, while discussing colonial documentaries and home movies made uh, in Indonesia. A similar area of discussion is that of film heritage featuring indigenous populations. In this case, uh, we can learn a lot from the longer tradition of film archives in uh, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, that have developed novel collection policies in close collaboration with native communities. On the screen, we can see a recent uh, activity by the Canadian project Archive Counter Archive, which focuses exactly on this idea of defining new archival practices based on the collaboration with local and or indigenous communities. A third category is that of uh, uh, diaspora films. Films made by, for instance, African descendants living around the globe. Here, a number of projects exist uh, to find, research, and show uh, films that have been made by diaspora filmmakers and have ended up in archives around the globe. A long-standing initiative in this direction is uh, June Giovanni's uh, Pan-African uh, uh, Cinema Archive uh, that you can see uh, in this slide. Another example of diaspora films are those made by exiled filmmakers around the world. Today, we will focus on the case of Chilean filmmakers who escaped the coup in 1973. What I mentioned so far are just a few examples of the big questions that are being discussed and will be discussed in many years to come within our field. As I said, the film and audiovisual archives are just beginning to join this emerging movement, recognizing the efforts already carried out for a long time by activists and grassroots initiatives. I Film Museum is committed to address these questions and to work with national and international colleagues and communities in these directions. Examples are, besides this series, uh, the annual conferences and some of our film programs. However, there is still a lot to be done. Before giving the word to our guest, Jose Miguel Palacios, I'd like to uh, mention that it is extremely timely uh, to be talking about Chilean exile uh, films today, as this year marks the 50th anniversary of the 1973 military coup that marked the beginning of a violent political suppression and the starting point of uh, the Chilean diaspora and the dissemination of Chilean films around the world. 
After this pre presentation, a, a conversation will follow between our guest and my dear colleague at the University of Amsterdam, Asli Özgen, who will also open up the forum to your questions. Now, I would like to introduce Isabel van der Berg, Emma van Kerkhoff, Lis Villamizar, uh, Yvonne Guyen, and Andrei Vilkov, who are uh, students of the This Is Film class. And on behalf of the group, Lis will introduce our guest. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it is my, my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Jose Miguel Palacios. Uh, he is a respected researcher and professor. He is currently serving as a faculty member at the Department of Film and Electronic Arts at California State University in Long Beach. Uh, he holds an MA in Film Studies from Columbia University and a PhD in Cinema Studies from the New York University. Um, prior to joining CSU Long Beach, he was a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the art department at the, univer at the Universidad Alberto de Hurtado uh, in Santiago, Chile. Palacios is a, published, is a published author with several articles and book chapters on film and media studies to his name. His research interests are wide-ranging, ra wide with a focus on transnational cinema, film archives, radical film cultures, documentaries, and Latin America and Chilean cinema. His work is driven by a strong commitment to social justice and human rights, and he has been published in a variety of journals, including Screen, Jump Cut, In Transition, La Fuga, and Archivos de la Filmoteca and also the edited collections, Cinematic Homecomings, Exile and Return in Transnational Cinema, and New Documentaries in Latin America, among others. Currently, Palacios is working on his book, Cinema Solidarity, a Transnational History of Chilean Exil Exile Film and Video, which builds on his previous work to offer a unique perspective viewing Chilean film exile films as a form of transnational cinema that emerged from global solidarity networks. So please join me in welcoming Jose Miguel Palacios. Well, thank you so much. Uh, hello, uh, buenas tardes. Um, thank you all for being here and thank you uh, for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction. Um, I really want to uh, take a moment uh, to uh, thank uh, Giovanna for the invitation and Ashley for uh, being in conversation with me. Um, uh, Eleni and Tessa and everyone here at the I team and all the students who are present um, and all of you in the audience. Um, it's a real uh, pleasure and an honor to be uh, a part of the This Is Film uh, series. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, talk um, and the screenings that uh, I have selected for you uh, today are uh, derived from this book that was just mentioned and that I'm um, currently working on, um, that it's titled Cinema Solidarity, Transnational History of Chilean Exile Film and Video. Um, so as the subtitle uh, indicates, uh, the book uh, offers uh, a transnational history of the production, uh, circulation, and reception of Chilean exile uh, cinema. <clears throat> so after uh, the 1973 uh, military coup that put an end to the socialist government of Salvador Allende, more than 200,000 uh, Chileans were forced into exile. Um, due to the more politicized nature of their filmic practice that was usually associated with the radical energy of the new Latin American cinema movement, uh, Chilean filmmakers were um, uh, part of this wave of uh, displacement, right? So in exile, they made over 200 uh, short, medium, and feature-length fiction films, uh, documentaries, uh, animated works, um, videos, and pieces for uh, television in countries as varied as Cuba, Canada, uh, Finland, France, uh, East and West Germany, uh, Mexico, Mozambique, Romania, 
Spain, Sweden, the UK, Venezuela, uh, the Soviet Union, United States, um, uh, among others, right? Um, and these films, Chilean exile films, varied um, in uh, genre, style, uh, and theme. Uh, many of these films constituted examples of a more radical uh, cinema that sought to uh, agitate uh, and move viewers towards political actions, such as, uh, you know, a couple of you know, two or three of our screenings uh, tonight. Uh, other films were devoted to uh, exile itself or to, uh, you know, the violence of the dictatorship. In um, some cases, uh, filmmakers found uh, ways to uh, discuss exile through a broader lens, uh, thinking about displacement and migration in the wake of a globalized uh, world. Uh, they created you know, fictional stories uh, about historical events or films that functioned as allegories, more siphoned allegories. Um, they reflected on the meanings of the nation by uh, interrogating other shared belongings, uh, such as indigenous identities uh, in Latin America, or they centered their attention on other revolutionary projects like the Santinista uh, program right in Nicaragua. And in many cases, they just purposefully try to move away from all explicit ties connecting them to Chile. Uh, so they made melodramas, thrillers, comedies, um, experimental films, feminist documentaries. Uh, so this diversity, and I, I speak of this diversity because it, it, it is connected to uh, you know, the archival uh, condition and location uh, of these films, right? Mm. So this diversity led um, Susana Pick, who was a fundamental scholar who wrote about uh, these films in the 1970s and 80s uh, to claim that Chilean exile cinema never really constituted a proper uh, movement, right, in the more programmatic sense uh, of, uh, of the term. Uh, so besides uh, a wide thematic and aesthetic range, uh, these films are also the result of as a variety of uh, the result of a variety of modes of production that the filmmakers encountered in their respective local uh, context, right? Um, and this I also mentioned because uh, it is, uh, again, tied to uh, the uh, sort of current archival condition uh, for uh, of these films, right? Because some uh, filmmakers were, uh, you know, making films for large uh, state studios in socialist countries uh, like DEFA in... Um, uh, the German Democratic Republic or Moss film uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, other filmmakers benefited from uh, small programs or of multicultural aid or uh, from the support of uh, national film institutes uh, like the National Film Board of Canada, uh, the Svenska Film Institute in Sweden, or the Instituto Nacional do Cinema in Mozambique. Um, some develop more high-scale, big-budget uh, co-productions um, at a continental and Ibero-American um, scale, like Miguel Litin, for instance, with this film, uh, Sandino. Some realize their projects with the support of independent production companies. Uh, some made their first uh, films while they were uh, film students, um, and some made experimental uh, television and some worked uh, independently, uh, completely in the margins of their respective uh, local uh, film uh, industries. And in terms of distribution and exhibition, um, uh, you know, some of these films were released in theaters, um, aired on uh, various television networks, primarily here in Europe. Uh, they played regularly in some film festivals. Uh, around the world, and they also enjoyed a uh, life in a range of uh, more alternative exhibition settings, right, including uh, film clubs, unions, uh, museums and galleries, public access television, uh, and solidarity uh, soirees, right, these events that mixed film screenings with uh, music performances and uh, political, uh, political speeches, right. Um, <clears throat> so in this... Um, in the sort of narrative arc of this uh, history that I'm uh, writing, um, uh, this book really traces the kind of, um, or echoes this exile journey, uh, beginning with 
the departure into exile and closing with the more recent process of return uh, of exile prints to Chilean archives uh, and museums, right? And this is really uh, the part that we're going to uh, focus on uh, today um, and very much following uh, Giovanna's initial uh, observations on uh, this movement towards decolonizing and, and repatriation and restitution, right? <clears throat> so uh, while I was while I was completing what was uh, then at the time uh, uh, probably too many more years ago than I than I want to say uh, when I, when I was completing uh, my dissertation uh, uh, I um, I was uh, you know I became more increasingly concerned about uh, the uh, archival location and condition of uh, exile films um, and videos and. Uh, after uh, I finished my degree, I uh, moved back to, to Chile and, and, and uh, got a, a grant uh, from the um, uh, National Agency uh, for Research and Development uh, that allowed me to uh, conduct uh, um, a postdoctoral project um, that lasted three years. And um, through that, I wanted to... Um, uh, find out the presence of, uh, you know, these 16 millimeter, 35 millimeter, or other kinds of filmic materials that, uh, you know, belonged or that were part of this Chilean exile cinema um, uh, phenomenon and that were uh, located in different archives uh, throughout the world. Um, and I also wanted to, uh, you know, find out uh, what were those films that had, uh, you know, returned uh, to Chile uh, and to study uh, the means by which this process of return had taken uh, had taken place. Uh, so the main results of uh, this research uh, were just uh, published in uh, this article uh, that you see there in the journal, The Moving Image. And, <clears throat> you know, I won't go over uh, everything uh, here, but I do want to um, uh, signal a few uh, key uh, key points and ideas uh, from um, that derive, you know, from the article and also from the larger uh, purpose of uh, this research, which was, you know, really about thinking about these relations between uh, exile, the archive, and and the writing of of transnational film histories, right, a history that sort of bypasses the boundaries of uh, the nation state, and to use this case of Chilean exile cinema as as a sort of case study um, uh, for that, right? <clears throat> so the vast, uh, the vast majority of uh, these uh, 16, 35 millimeter uh, viewing prints or original negatives or sound elements or umatic uh, videotapes um, and uh, other uh, film and video materials that correspond to Chilean exile uh, cinema are currently stored in uh, national film archives and cinema uh, museums, uh, production companies, television archives, university libraries, uh, archives of political parties, uh, labor archives uh, throughout the world, right? Uh, which is uh, an evidence of the uh, geographic dispersion uh, suffered uh, by their makers uh, and also evidence of the very uh, different right industrial conditions uh, under which uh, the Chile Chilean directors uh, worked right and that's why I was taking a few minutes to explain uh, all the different kinds of, uh, of films and places uh, that uh, they worked with right uh, so this is what um, uh, my colleague uh, Elizabeth Ramirez and I call uh, the scattered body uh, of uh, Chilean exile cinema um, a concept that uh, she uses borrowing the um, title from one of Raul Ruiz's early exile films that was called The Scattered Body and the World uh, Upside Down. Um, <clears throat> so uh, since the mid, really mid, starting around the mid 2000s, uh, part of this corpus has uh, begun its return to Chilean institutions 
most notably uh, these four uh, archives, Cineteca Nacional de Chile, which is the National Film Archive, Cineteca de la Universidad de Chile, which is the State University Archive, uh, Museo de la Memoria y los Derechos Humanos, the Museum of Memory and Human Rights, um, and uh, also Archivo Ruiz Sarmiento, uh, which is um, dedicated to uh, that couple of filmmakers. And these films have returned um, through uh, mechanisms such as, uh, you know, uh, individual donations by filmmakers or signing um, international uh, cooperation agreements between uh, archives and institutions, and also uh, through the programming of special uh, retrospectives, right? Because exhibiting uh, these films, these exile films in theaters uh, and loaning them for series organized by other uh, institutions or film festivals uh, has been uh, one of the main ways uh, used by these four archives um, to bring this diasporic closer, um, uh, corpus closer to Chilean audiences, right? To activate, to go back to that metaphor um, and that verb, um, this corpus uh, for the audiences, right? And this is a significant goal uh, considering that, uh, you know, most exile films never really received theatrical distribution in Chile uh, and were never programmed on uh, national uh, television there. Uh, and access has increased uh, in recent years thanks to uh, digitization projects um, and the inclusion of some of these films in uh, the online platforms of uh, these archives. Uh, Cineteca Virtual from the State University and uh, Cineteca Nacional Online, which is the virtual platform of the National uh, Film Archive. Uh, so I also want to clarify that, uh, you know, this process I mentioned, you know, beginning in the mid uh, 2000s. Um, and um, this is, uh, uh, you know, for various reasons. Um, uh, among them, and most importantly, is that the Chilean film archives are uh, relatively new, right? So um, the State University uh, Cinematheque, uh, which was um, until 1973 the country's uh, most important film archive, was uh, completely dismantled, right, after uh, the coup, uh, and it only reopened in 2008. Uh, Cineteca Nacional de Chile, the National Film Archive, uh, was founded only in 2006 um, and uh, has been uh, a FIEF member, uh, the International Federation of Film Archives, uh, since 2009. Uh, and the Museum of Memory and Human Rights, um, together with its audiovisual archive, uh, were created in uh, 2010, right? Um, and in addition to being uh, to being new, uh, these institutions face uh, a permanent condition of uh, precariousness, right? And sometimes a fraught relationship with uh, you know with the state. Um, and here I always uh, like to quote uh, Janet Sejal Calas' uh, words when she said that the Latin American archives were uh, the orphans of the moving image uh, archival uh, infrastructure. <clears throat> uh, so just to give you an example, for instance, while uh, Cineteca Nacional, the National Film Archive, functions Theoretically, as uh, a state uh, public uh, institution, its, uh, its legal status um, uh, corresponds uh, to a, uh, a private uh, foundation, right? Um, and this um, particularity has forced it, um, you know, to compete really for state grants, uh, basically to fund uh, all its different uh, programs from, you know, collection development, um, educational research projects, and uh, and programming too, right? Um, <clears throat> and besides these uh, structural uh, challenges, um, there are other problems that emerge for uh, Chilean archives when dealing with this exilic uh, corpus, um, first and foremost, uh, linguistic barriers, right? Um, geographical dispersion in too many uh, international archives and too many different kinds of archives, uh, lack of sufficient uh, participation in global archival networks like FIAF due to those funding uh, restrictions, right? And a lack of uh, a detailed uh, filmography uh, for um, Chilean exile cinema. Uh, the most complete, really, uh, catalog uh, to date was published uh, in 1984, um, 
uh, by Susanna Peake, and it lists, uh, you know, 176 films that were produced in exile until 1983. Um, I have been forever trying to update, uh, you know, this catalog, but it's a uh, never-ending uh, task uh, and um, uh, and also an incomplete task. But um, you know, from my research, I can estimate, uh, you know, over 230, 240 uh, films. <clears throat> Okay, so um, this process of um, uh, returns and repatriations of uh, Chilean exile cinema have, um, you know, relevant uh, implications for uh, understanding the role of this mostly unseen body of work uh, in uh, in national film history, but also for uh, situating, you know, its its material first, you know, material concrete, uh, but also the, its symbolic function, right, in uh, in the country, uh, you know, almost 30 years after the end of the dictatorship and now in this particular context that we're in, as Giovanna was mentioning, the 50th anniversary, anniversary of the coup, right? Um, and this uh, sort of larger phenomenon is uh, what I refer to as uh, archival uh, returns, which is the process uh, that you know has brought prints and copies of these exile films to Chilean archives uh, and museums uh, in dialogue with uh, the sort of cultural demands, the historical narratives, and the memory debates that are activated by this process uh, of uh, return. Um, and uh, these returns uh, also speak uh, about, uh, you know, broader questions in uh, film and cultural heritage, right? Um, you know, where do uh, exile films uh, belong, right? And what uh, cultural uh, institutions uh, can, uh, especially if those institutions, you know, bear the title of national, uh, what uh, institutions can claim uh, a right to them? <clears throat> Uh, so this um, uh, Hamid Nafisi, who is a scholar of um, exile and diasporic cinemas, what he has called interstitiality, right? Um, the sort of being in between is at the heart of uh, the exile condition, right? And it is one of the main uh, reasons why um, I... Uh, you know, oftentimes avoid uh, the use of uh, repatriation uh, as a concept and as practice for dealing with this, you know, exile, th with this form of exile cultural uh, production, right? And and this is because, uh, you know, exile cinemas and Chilean exile cinemas, you know, they pose a uh, specific kind of anom anomaly, right, for the film archive. Um, and I think there's two big reasons uh, for this. And one refers to the, uh, you know, political nature of exile as an experience of uh, forced uh, displacement coupled with uh, the uh, explicit political project of a cinema of, you know, resistance against uh, the dictatorship. Uh, so in this regard, the travels and uh, movements of these exile prints uh, often respond to uh, the intricacies, right, of these... Um, um, uh, a, a, cir a, a network of circulation uh, that is uh, based on, uh, you know, a, a movement of transnational solidarity uh, with the Chilean people. And, uh, and here, a range of actors that normally fall under the cracks of the archive, right, uh, intervene. Um, <clears throat> These solidarity communities, uh, 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 committees, exile communities, uh, embassies, consulates, uh, labor organizations, film clubs, uh, and the like. Right. Uh, and the second reason speaks uh, to this question of uh, belonging. Right. Um, so Giovanna was mentioning earlier, even you know how it is very difficult to. Uh, uh, really take uh, literally this uh, concept of uh, repatriation, right? Uh, but there are still, you know, some moments, right, especially in, in this, uh, you know, post-colonial context and in and, and some instances of uh, war, right, uh, war conflicts where um, uh, material artifacts and films, right, uh, film prints uh, sort of have been usurped, right, from, by some uh, foreign power, right, and are therefore... Uh, subject to uh, repatriation, right? But in the case of exile and these um, exile cinemas, uh, the 
this from uh, remains highly uh, ambiguous, right? Uh, because these films, uh, you know, belong simultaneously, uh, you know, here and there. If there were exo films made here in the Netherlands, right? Um, <clears throat> Or uh, Sweden, or France, uh, or Mexico, uh, they are, you know, part of that uh, uh, nation as well, and part of that, you know, film culture and context. Uh, and they are also part of uh, the Chilean uh, heritage, and they have uh, always an oscillating uh, sense of belonging to these two, right? Uh, uh, either belonging to both, or maybe uh, to neither, right? Uh, so I always speak of these returns instead of uh, the more common uh, notion of repatriation, uh, simply because return is the concept that connects the films, right, as a form of cultural er heritage with the specific historical conditions that produce the films, which is exile, right? Uh, so return, I believe the word return charges the operation of cultural transfer and exchange uh, with uh, a sense, a deeper sense of historical restitution, right, which is what matters here. Um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so this, uh, these are, you know, some um, uh, conceptual uh, dimensions that I wanted uh, to bring uh, to the table uh, today, and, um, and, and now I want to move forward to uh, a couple of um, you know, projects of collaboration and international exchange, and this will uh, pave the way for the, the films that I'm going to introduce uh, today too. So during this, uh, you know, research project that I was conducting, I, uh, I, I, I strengthened um, the partnership that I had with uh, Cineteca Nacional, the National Film Archive. I had you know, I had had connections uh, and dialogue with them uh, for a long time. Maybe I should have started saying that, you know, I am not an archivist. I am a, you know, film, primarily a film scholar, uh, but I have been, uh, you know, working uh, with archives uh, in this um, uh, desire to recover some of these films, you know, for a long, uh, for a long time. Um, <clears throat> So I, uh, I strengthened my, my dialogue with them and um, uh, we did a, a few things together. I curated a, a special uh, online program uh, of Exile Films um, uh, that were already uh, in their collections um, and we also uh, sort of developed a plan, um, a strategic plan for securing the return of more of these Exile uh, films. Um, so I established a, a, you know, a reduced filmography of titles uh, whose uh, presence in Chile, I thought, uh, should be deemed uh, a priority. Um, <clears throat> and since I had been uh, working also uh, due to some programming events uh, and to the research, through the research trips that I had done in the past, um, I had a, already a working relationship with uh, some of the curators at the Swedish Film Institute. So we decided to uh, target them and initiate an, an exchange project uh, with them, right? So uh, in I think around May 2020, I um, you know, uh, sort of uh, got in touch once again with um, uh, the senior curator, uh, Jan Wengström, uh, at the Swedish Film Institute uh, to talk more seriously about uh, ways in which um, uh, prints could be, you know, either loaned for programming uh, or eventually be digitized uh, in a way that would allow uh, copies uh, to remain uh, in, uh, in Cineteca Nacional. And um, the response from them was um, uh, immediately very positive and uh, also emphasizing the importance, right, of bringing these exile films uh, to Chile and to a contemporary audience. Uh, and all of this was framed um, within uh, you know, the long history of solidarity ties between uh, Sweden uh, and Chile, and also with the you know, deep recognition of uh, the large Chilean exile community that arrived uh, in Sweden uh, after, uh, after the coup, right? Um, so I say that uh, too, because I, you know, again, I think uh, as Giovanna was mentioning, the, the field uh, has changed uh, a lot uh, in uh, you know in the past five ten years, uh, and uh, institutions are now much more you know receptive uh, to this kind uh, you know of exchange. But obviously, the deeply sort of effective emotional connection uh, that um, 
uh, a lot of uh, people still have uh, with uh, the history of the Chilean exile experience and the coup and the dictatorship, you know, plays an important role. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, based on a list that I that I had given them, we uh, agreed on uh, on seven priority uh, uh, titles and. Uh, discussed a number of possibilities for moving forward with this process, uh, which were, you know, uh, naturally shaped by the material conditions of the prints and their status. Right, uh, some films uh, they had the original negatives. Um, uh, some were um, prints that were considered uh, master elements. Um, uh, also, the slowing, considering the slowing of the digitization workflows in Sweden uh, due to the pandemic at the time, uh, the financial limitations of the archive in Chile. <clears throat> So in the end, we agreed on a strategy that uh, meant that the uh, Swedish Film Institute would digitize uh, all uh, sound and image uh, at their facility um, and provide uh, uh, the raw files to the film archive in Chile. And Cineteca Nacional would sort of sync, master, and create the digital viewing uh, copies uh, for these. And, and both archives would obviously have access to uh, and safeguard uh, the finished uh, digital version of these uh, seven uh, seven films, and this process of digitization was complete uh, by the end of I think September uh, two thousand and twenty one. And uh, I see this really as a, as a kind of model of digital returns where the uh, labor and the results of this process of, uh, you know, scanning, syncing, mastering, and eventually later uh, restoring um, you know, can be shared right by both the providers of the original materials and also the main beneficiary, in this case, uh, the National uh, Film Archive. And this is a model that can be, uh, you know, easily replicated. Uh, and uh, in fact, you know, I am here uh, now because uh, I was uh, here last year for the previous, uh, the seventh um, I International Conference um, on Global Audiovisual Exchange and spoke about this project. Uh, and thanks to Giuliana and also curators, uh, Simona, uh, Monisa, and, and Romy Albers, um, <clears throat> uh, my colleague uh, Elizabeth Ramirez and I were able to uh, view, review some materials that we knew uh, were part of the ICE uh, collection. And, uh, and we were interested in them. Um, and, and one of them uh, was uh, particularly uh, interesting for us. Um, and, and here is where I move to uh, say a few words about the first uh, material that I'm going to share uh, with you. Uh, so uh, a few years uh, ago, because I had originally planned a research trip uh, here to Amsterdam, I think for 2020, which was the year of the pandemic, so that didn't happen. So when I was doing that kind of uh, research in the database, uh, which is open uh, of the eye, uh, I came across this uh, title labeled uh, simply Chili Documentaire, uh, and that was attributed to uh, Pablo de la Barra. Uh, so we had never heard of uh, this title, and really, you know, it doesn't it didn't really seem to be a, a title. It was more a, a, apparently a generic description, right, for uh, for the film. And we also had no records of uh, De La Barra or no knowledge of De La Barra making uh, a documentary in uh, 1973. Uh, so when uh, viewing uh, the 16 millimeter print at uh, the Eye Collection Center, uh, we immediately realized that this was uh, raw footage of uh, downtown Santiago on September 11, 1973, uh, the day uh, of uh, the coup, right? <clears throat> and uh, so given uh, the significance of this 50th year anniversary, the, the material became uh, a priority. And uh, I am once again very grateful uh, to uh, the I uh, team uh, for uh, believing in the need to uh, participate in uh, this global exchange project of uh, digital returns and also for quickly doing um, a scan of the material. Um, and uh, uh, we're going to screen a, a DCP um, uh, for you today. And I'm very excited to watch this with you because I've only seen it in the uh, viewing table and not uh, on uh, the big screen. Uh, let me say a few words about uh, you know, uh, what, you want to, what you're going to see and its significance. Uh, and 
around August 1973, uh, Pablo de la Barra was making a film, a fiction film about, um, the film was about two brothers who were militants of a radical uh, political party and who are trying to seek an, a, 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 a radicalization of uh, you know, these leftist strategies, um, expropriations, land takeovers, and, and so on. So they were making this film and then um, the last day of shooting was scheduled for, uh, you know, September 11, uh, 1973. So for obvious reasons, uh, the shooting of this uh, fiction film uh, did not happen, did not continue. And um, I can tell you, you know, the production history of this film, uh, which uh, was eventually going to be completed four years later in Venezuela, and, and it's going to be titled uh, Queridos Compañeros, Dear Comrade, Comrades is, you know, very complicated, and I can talk more about it uh, in the Q and A if you're curious. But what matters for uh, this uh, story is that uh, on September 11, uh, Leonardo de la Barra, uh, who was the film's assistant cinematographer and also the director's brother, uh, he is the one who grabbed a 16 millimeter camera and uh, went out to the streets uh, to shoot. Um, and uh, the coup, uh, as you probably know, is visually tied to uh, the famous images of the bombardment of uh, the presidential palace, La Moneda, and this footage, you see a picture now, but the footage, uh, the moving image footage was captured by two cameramen who were working for uh, the East German duo Heinoski and, Sch and Schulman. Uh, and these images of the bombardment has have been, you know, featured in numerous documentaries. Almost every documentary uh, that deals about, uh, you know, Chile and the topic, right? Uh, but the raw footage that we're going to see, uh, you know, today is uh, altogether, you know, different and. It offers a counterpoint to the more spectacular violence of the bombardment, right? And provides a broader look at the events uh, of the day. And this is, uh, I think, what is probably the first public screening of uh, these images captured by Leonardo uh, de la Barra, who would later uh, was later going to live uh, as an exile in uh, in France and then Belgium, um, and uh, and make uh, a few short films uh, there. Uh, so I hope you enjoy these images, and let me uh, reiterate once again that this is raw footage, so it's unedited uh, material, and there is no sound uh, either. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm going to... Uh, introduce very quickly uh, the other uh, films. Uh, the next three films are part of the uh, of this collaboration uh, between the Swedish Film Institute and, and the National Archive uh, in Chile. Uh, the first two uh, were uh, directed by uh, Sergio Castilla, um, and uh, the first one is about uh, five minutes long, and it has this, you know, great uh, title, um, uh, which translates as, uh, you know, Pinochet, fascist, uh, assassin, uh, you know, murderer, traitor, agent of uh, imperialism. And uh, the other one is titled... Um, Quisiera, quisiera tener un hijo. I wish, I wish uh, I had a son. Um, both of these films use uh, children's uh, drawings um, and um, to sustain uh, the visual uh, narrative. Uh, in the first one, it's an, uh, the voice of an adult. Uh, in the second one, we have uh, the voice of a girl uh, who speaks... Uh, and who informs us that we're seeing these drawings made by children who had witnessed uh, the coup. And, uh, uh, you know, both films uh, have this uh, end with this call for uh, solidarity and, uh, and a message uh, of, uh, of hope. Um, okay, let's play the next uh, two, please. Thank you. Okay, and very briefly, I will uh, introduce um, the last um, film, um, which uh, is titled um, Color Contra el Fascismo, uh, Color, uh, Color Against Fascism. It's a 20-minute film, uh, and it documents the activities um, of an exhibition 
that took place in uh, Stockholm's uh, Moderna Museet um, in uh, March and April uh, in 1978. And this was um, organized by uh, the Museo de la Solidaridad Salvador Allende, which had begun in 1971 as a museum uh, for the hundreds of paintings and other works of art that were donated to Chile uh, by international artists in solidarity with uh, the political project of Allende and uh, his popular unity uh, coalition. But after the coup, the museum uh, was, uh, well, first it was renamed Museo Internacional de la Resistencia, and it began to function as a kind of seatless uh, museum, an exilic institution that had no, no precise uh, location and which organized shows in different parts, uh, different art venues uh, throughout the world. Uh, so this one uh, they did in Stockholm uh, in 1978, and one of the highlights was the creation of this collective mural uh, in which um, uh, this Chilean artist, which was quite renowned, Jose Balmes, uh, participated with other Swedish artists, uh, whom you will see in this film. Uh, and Balmes had been making murals before in Chile during the Allende government, and in fact, Leonardo Céspedes, who was one of the three directors uh, of this documentary, had, had made a previous film in Chile about this uh, this making of the murals. Um, uh, so in this new film, uh, Color Contra el Fascismo, you will see that he incorporates the footage from this previous film that was made in 1971, uh, Pintando con el Pueblo. Uh, okay, so this is the last film, a different uh, look into um, international solidarity. Uh, and after this, we will have a, a conversation. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jose, uh, for uh, sharing uh, these unseen films with us. It was really intense, and I remember last time um, I saw this last film in the um, I um, International Conference, and there is this. Uh, it ends with this moment where also people in the room start uh, chanting. So I always have this expectation: Are we going to chant <laughs> with? Uh, um, uh, so um, I want to, um, I have a lot of questions, but I first want to um, maybe give the um, room to the audience. Do we have any questions? Yes, I see one, Nico. Um, thank you for your interesting... Uh, There's a uh, mic. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your interesting talk and the work uh, that you've done, um, important work. Um, it's, uh, for me, there's a, a little personal thing because it was, this, this was my political awakening, September 11, 1973, so that's why I'm interested, so I realize, realize how important this is. There's one thing, though, that bothers me a little because when you talk about returns um, and I look at some of the prints that I've shown, some of the translations are by you, so what is actually being returned? Is that different from what we have just seen here? Because this seems to be like something for international distribution or international conferences and festivals. So what, what actually were the prints that were, I, I assume, distributed in Sweden? Probably different uh, uh, subtitles or something. So what did they look like? And, and what then does it mean if or no, let me rephrase this, what is then actually returned to Chile? And does that still contain the original uh, production and, and distribution context? Well, thank you. That that's an excellent uh, question, and uh, and it tackles some of the uh, you know some of the problems uh, that 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 we deal uh, with this uh, kind of project. Uh, I think. Uh, well, let let, let me. Uh, say a few things. Uh, one is, of course, um, this question, and this goes back right to um, uh, uh, Giovanna's original um, uh, observations uh, regarding how to translate this uh, whole language of uh, repatriation and, uh, and restitution from sort of the art world uh, to uh, you know uh, the film world, where uh, there's uh, let's say non, not necessarily an original right um, uh, a, a print right uh, in this case uh, in some cases. 
um, what uh, certain collections or museums have or archives uh, you know, could be considered uh, a unique print, right, if there is uh, uh, not a different one. Uh, but uh, certainly those prints uh, carry themselves, carry with themselves uh, a whole uh, production and circulation uh, history, right? Uh, some of them, um, you know, uh, exhibit uh, uh, are in worse condition due to their um, uh, how often or not, right? They they played in these uh, sort of uh, networks of solidarity, right? Some uh, like another of the films that we have uh, that the eye has here. Uh, which is called A los Pueblos del Mundo, To the Peoples of the World, uh, you know, has the Dutch subtitles because uh, it was distributed by this, uh, you know, Dutch uh, radical distribution company and so on, right? So uh, obviously all, all of those, uh, you know, material elements, right, that are embedded into, uh, into the films themselves are, uh, are part of that history. And in this case, um, when... Um, uh, this kind of digital uh, returns is uh, precisely a way to, uh, on the one hand, uh, deal with uh, the you know the precarious reality of uh, you know archives in in places like Chile, right, where they can not necessarily uh, you know deal with. Um, uh, the uh, you know the shipping of prints and all those things right and also uh, in some cases where um, the uh, holders right of the materials like in this case for instance the Swedish Film Institute also considers it you know very uh, very uh, you know delicate since um, some of those were actually uh, sort of unique masters master elements right so. Um, um, the uh, uh, did I think the digitization um, bypasses, or you know, the sort of digital returns bypasses some of those financial uh, uh, institutional restrictions. Uh, on the one hand, uh, on the other, uh, it also emphasizes this um, uh, need that perhaps uh, the physical. Uh, return in terms of the act of depositing uh, is not necessarily the most important thing, right? Because as you're saying, what what is it that is being returned? Uh, what is being returned? And this is something that, you know, we have talked about and, and I talk a little bit about, you know, in the, ar in the article is that um, um, return is not, a, not necessarily or not only, right, about that act, right? It's about, again, you know, the activating of uh, of that uh, gesture uh, of returning, right? It's about uh, giving access to these materials, right? It's about visibility of these materials. It's about, uh, you know, circulating them. Uh, and um, so in this case, yes, uh, I am here sort of presenting this right now to this, you know, audience in this kind of context, and it has, uh, and I have done it in a couple of conferences, but the whole goal is, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to bring, uh, you know, for people and institutions in Chile to, uh, you know, begin programming these uh, and, uh, and using them, uh, you know, for their, um, uh, you know, for their uh, curatorial um, uh, lines of work, which are not for me to, de you know, uh, to determine, right? So uh, I, you know, I, I, I have been um, uh, somewhat of a of a mediator in this process and 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 sort of an instigator, or uh, uh, because uh, for for various reasons. Um, which have to do with, you know, the sort of uh, complicated uh, legacies of exile, uh, the lack of, um, uh, you know, proper institutions to deal with these things, lack of interest, uh, a growing, um, uh, a more recent um, reevaluation, right, of the legacies of exile, uh, a, a younger generation uh, that is interested in these materials and so on. This is a, 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 a sort of somewhat of a, a new a more recent process of uh, giving new value, right, to uh, to these uh, films. Uh, so, um, but in many cases, and and for the last you know ten years, and this is not only me, but the you know uh, a few of my colleagues, uh, you know, we have felt 
uh, oftentimes that it's us, right, who are, you know, pushing, uh, and um, which is not necessarily a bad thing, uh, uh, but now um, that there has been, uh, you know, more results with uh, other uh, other arch archives, um, um, uh, and uh, I am particularly hopeful for this, you know, coming, uh, you know, for this year, and the kinds of programs that institutions there, uh, you know, will be able to do, um, uh, also including some of some of these materials, right? So, um, what is returning uh, the 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 films, the, you know, the um, in this case, there's not a, a you know the return of a print, right? Uh, but it's uh, you know the possibility of um, um, yeah giving new life uh, to these films in a uh, in a in, in a particular context uh, you know uh, today uh, and how um, some of these films uh, come to. Uh, yeah, unsettle. I guess are, are are present, right? And 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 that's um, a process uh, that is not necessarily that we cannot prescribe how it goes, right? Um, but uh, and that this is only sort of like the beginning uh, of that. Yeah. Thanks for clearing that up. And uh, I think it's all the the difficulties that you sketch. I mean, it's all the more important that people understand what they're looking at and what they're hearing. Mm -hmm. And for the rest, keep up the good work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think what you said just, uh, Jose, um, brought to my mind what you said about the linguistic barriers and the language issues that you also encountered in archives. And another question that is um, also like giving shape to all these like repatriation and return issues is what is being returned to, but also to whom it is being returned to. Uh, most of the cases, uh, the communities are very much scattered, so that also reminds me what you wrote in your article, the scattered body as the, um, uh, the image for all these, you know, Chilean exile films, the whole corpus that is scattered. Uh, and therefore uh, includes actually communities that are using many languages. Now we're talking about second, maybe even third generation. So the issue of language is a lot more complex than just returning to the national, and which, which you actually um, discuss uh, in depth uh, in your article. But I want to uh, stay a little bit more in this return and activating, giving these films new lives and the meaning of showing them in Chile. Um, so maybe most of these people couldn't go back uh, and uh, there's new generation, new political environment as well. And um, you mentioned how um, screening or activating these films would also mean maybe activating a new memory discourse, or they definitely play a role in the memory politics. So what kind of memories do they activate, and do they enable any form of maybe um, resolution when it comes to human rights violations that they also uh, help us witness? Yeah, uh, thank you, Asli. Um, uh, that's a uh, that's a great um, uh, question. Uh, I think um, the uh, there's the the uh, the issue of uh, you know what memories do they activate or uh, it's I think. It's part in, in in a lot of cases. It is part of you know creating this uh, sort of transgenerational dialogue, right? Uh, um, uh, based on uh, these histories uh, of exile. Some films, you know, not the ones that I that I showed here, right? But especially the films that are uh, either documentary or fictional films that are much more focused on uh, the exile experience itself. Uh, the whole. Um, uh, uh, social, psychological experience uh, of exile, um, you know, creates uh, creates a space for that. And um, I think you know, there's one institution that has done a, a really good job in that regard, which is the Museum of, uh, of Memory and Human Rights, which is again sort of like the sort of like the institutional space for doing that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the way that, you know, they're like this kind of space, right, the screenings that they do uh, always, um, uh, you know, bringing uh, uh, 
you know, activists and survivors and, uh, you know, filmmakers, uh, uh, children, uh, grandchildren of uh, some of the people involved, uh, you know, do, uh, you know, do create uh, those kinds of, uh, of dialogues. And I have, you know, witnessed that as a, as a spectator in, uh, in some cases. And it's, uh, you know, and it's very, uh, it's very powerful when, you know, a, a film can be, uh, sort of the pre the 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 excuse for that uh, you know for that kind of exchange, um, and, and I I I would also say I was thinking about you know in terms of uh, how how to activate, uh, but also this process of return uh, that is you know very long uh, and that you know it, again it's not auto automatic right it's not that the film returns or that you show it one time and then oh the memory is activated right or something happens yeah there is a as you were saying uh, there can be this sort of like bodily transmission of energy which is you know very nice when that happens uh, and it's the first step but uh, but a a a a, a, a more in depth cultural process, right, takes more time. Uh, and uh, the first thing that came to my mind is uh, in, you know, 10 years ago, uh, 2013, um, a, a group of colleagues and I, we, we organized a, a retrospective for uh, a film festival in Chile, the Valdivia International Film Festival, and it was a retrospective uh, focused on on the work of uh, three uh, women filmmakers in exile, um, Marilu Malet, Angelina Vasquez, and Valeria Sarmiento, who were based in Finland, uh, Canada, and France uh, mostly, uh, and 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 their films, uh, you know, most of their films had never uh, played in Chile, um, um, and. Uh, it was uh, an important uh, effort that we did. It was not as, um, we didn't have the resources. It was not as big or as comprehensive as we, as we would have wanted. Uh, but I, I bring this uh, to, uh, to light because uh, I think we were also very much frustrated at the time with what we perceived as a lack of, you know, uh, response or sufficient engagement. Uh, and, uh, but over the years, uh, their films uh, have, uh, you know, begun uh, to circulate much more uh, profusely. And, uh, you know, part of that is connected to uh, there's been, uh, you know, post-2017, uh, 2018, um, uh, the, you know, sort of uh, feminist revolt year in Chile, but also, you know, broader sort of like Me Too move, uh, movements and so on. There's been a much more active, right, uh, uh, need for situating the work of women filmmakers um, at the forefront. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we did this retrospective, uh, you know, that context wasn't there. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, but now, now it is, right? So those films, uh, you know, have been part of, uh, you know, frequent and regular programming. Uh, there was an edited collection that was uh, published uh, uh, about, uh, you know, that sort of emerged from the, uh, the series, and that happened in 2016. Uh, the films, I don't know if, you know, you or some of you might have been familiar with this uh, exhibit that was done in, in, in Berlin uh, by uh, Erika Balsam and Hila Pele called No Master's Territory, so they included uh, some of those films uh, there. Um, and again, uh, and this, you know, it has taken 10 years, right, for, uh, you know, those films to uh, encounter, uh, you know, new audiences and new, um, and to resonate uh, with viewers um, um, in a different way through this, uh, let's call it feminist reawakening, right, uh, of the past uh, five years, right? So um, I think, you know, to go back to this question of what is activated in that, you know, for instance, in that particular case, uh, a, a more, uh, in a way, a, a more gender-based, uh, you know, expression of, uh, of solidarity, but also going back to your previous question, right, in terms of, you know, how sometimes, you know, how long it takes for, uh, you know, for these returns to gain some kind of meaning, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and uh, um, 
That's very interesting because you, in your article, you also, like when you open up this concept of return, it's not only that act of giving back, but it, it is really linked to invisibility and that uh, happens on many different levels uh, indeed and part of many different cultural uh, processes uh, as well. I want to first look at the audience if we have any questions in the meantime. Yes, I see one there. Thank you for your, your very lovely uh, intricate talk. I wanted to ask you to maybe expand a little bit more on the legal um, uh, space or, or the definition of uh, a cinematic in, in Chile that does not have a real national status in the sense of it being a private uh, institution, because I think that complicates um, what we consider a national uh, archive. And maybe, I mean, I understand the financial implications and what you are relating to in the case of Chile, of it being something that's constantly uh, in danger of, of not being able to exist. But I think it complicates it also on a very interesting level where those archives are separated from a government and therefore of implications of what a government wants to do in the case of silencing uh, um, films or archives or a certain protest revolution yeah. etc so maybe you can comment a little bit about that yeah thank you that's uh, um, uh, they are and they are not uh, uh, separated uh, and uh, I think uh, there's a um, uh, well two concrete things that uh, I can say about this one is that you know it's not uh, solely the case of uh, an institution like uh, uh, Cineteca Nacional in the sense that I think, you know, post-1990, and this is a direct uh, legacy of, uh, you know, the, the the privatization model of the dictatorship, right? It's that, you know, the, they're, they're, uh, you know we live under these, um, uh, uh, a, a fiction of the public, uh, you know, uh, 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 and uh, it's these uh, institutions, right, that are presented uh, and uh, and and ruled by, and that uh, really have the weight of uh, the state, but they are not legally uh, a, a state uh, uh, institution, right? Um, and but I do have to say that um, this is something that uh, you know that has, uh, it, with regards to Cineteca Nacional de Chile, you know, should change. Um, because there was a law, um, a national act that was passed a few years ago that created a new ministry of uh, cultures and patrimony, uh, and um, the 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 Cineteca Nacional would, uh, under this law, uh, officially uh, be uh, um, a part of the sort of like state institutions equivalent to like the National Library and so on. Uh, but this means, um, so this again, in theory, what the law dictates, right? And then how that translates into practice, uh, you know, it's taken over, uh, you know, five years or six years because there's a, a whole transfer, right, of, uh, uh, you know, it has to do with, uh, you know, uh, you know, how the uh, the workers, right, who, uh, you know, uh, are part of the institution, right, how to, uh, you know, transfer that kind of um, legal status uh, and uh, the board and so on. Uh, so um, <clears throat> uh, I know that uh, there was the, when this government of uh, President Boric uh, took office uh, uh, for the ministry, of culture that was a priority. It was something that they were going to work on. Uh, now they changed the Minister of Culture. There's a new one. Uh, I don't know exactly um, uh, right now if you ask me, uh, you know, how this, you know, process is going, right? So again, it um, to go back to your question, I think the problem is that this sort of fictitious or ambiguous uh, uh status as a state institution uh, gives, uh, you know, puts the, the National Archive in, in sort of the worst of the positions, right, because it cannot really um, uh, benefit from uh, the funding of uh, those institutions, and at the same time, it is still subject to the uh, indetermination, right, and the oscillations of uh, 
uh, of local politics, right? That if, you know, there's a new minister and then maybe uh, the uh, uh, direction of work, right, or the priorities change, right? And I don't know if, you know, um, bringing, again, the National Film Archive into uh, the ministry as the law dictates is a priority of, uh, of this new uh, Minister of Culture, right? So. Um, maybe related to that, uh, the institutions and the role of institutions and their scope and then their positioning, in your article you uh, mentioned how digital also opens up, you know, new possibilities for more accessibility visibility, activation, and therefore uh, uh, return uh, potential. Um, you also mentioned briefly uh, a post-custodial model. Uh, could you please maybe elaborate a bit more on that? Uh, how, how, how is that envisioned, the post-custodial model? Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, uh, I don't, um, uh, maybe, again, this is uh, 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 not entirely my own, uh, I would say my and other, uh, you know, other colleagues uh, who have been working on this, but our uh, desire um, in the sense of um, the, the post-custodial as a kind of model that would, again, sort of de-emphasize the uh, act of the deposit, right, uh, and would also uh, emphasize the, uh, 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 the decenteredness, right, mm -hmm. of the of the collection, right, the fact that this is something that uh, you know belongs to multiple uh, mm -hmm. people, right, multiple languages, multiple uh, geographies, right. Um, uh, a lot of, I mean, not a lot, but you know, some of these films uh, are already um, uh, part of the virtual online platforms of multiple archives, not only in Chile but you know in Sweden, uh, in uh, in Canada. Uh, in France and so on, right? Uh, so I think um, it's it's feasible to conceive of a model, right, uh, or a kind of let's say digital humanities project or something like that could that could um, um, uh, organize or you know uh, uh, or put in dialogue these sort mm -hmm. of scattered materials that are already. Uh, uh, online uh, and uh, of course offering um, uh, a his you know a historical uh, narrative uh, a curatorial narrative right because mm -hmm. that that is uh, what uh, is sometimes lacking right um, and and you asked me about you know these uh, possibilities but also the limitations in a way of um, of you know, what appears online simply as uh, as content, right? As content that is, uh, you know, deprived of their um, uh, their material history, but also their contextual history, right? So I would envision uh, a virtual space that uh, would perhaps honor the um, the lack of a fixed location mm -hmm. of these materials, right? Uh, but also the, um, that would also offer, um, uh, a, 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 yeah, a curatorial vision mm -hmm. for, for, these, for these materials. Yeah. Um, and that also, uh, I kind of, uh, when I was watching the last film that you showed, the sort of the resistance museum, that is also a traveling <laughs> one that doesn't yeah. have a fixed location, so yeah. that's probably a little bit, uh, could be one model. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the museum was, uh, after 1990, after the return of democracy, it, it, it was renamed once again Museo de la Solidaridad, uh, and and it has it has a, a home of its own. It has a space, and I think you know mm -hmm. this. Uh, that that's something, for instance, that uh, we still uh, need to do um, uh, uh, in Chile because uh, this film, the last film, uh, Color contra el fascismo, um, I think it's a very important film for that museum too, and for the history of that museum. And they should be able to. Um, to also work with this and and activate it in the way so that they see uh, that they see fit. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Um, looking at the audience again, maybe we have other questions, comments. Andre, yeah. Uh, 
Um, yeah, thank you for your talk, first of all. Um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly get back to the, yeah, the institution. And um, I haven't really properly formulated the question yet, but I was wondering if you also already saw, seen some transformations in the institutions themselves, um, not from a government perspective, but just through the dealing with these films, dealing with these collections, and yeah, what do you see? I was actually wondering about that. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I think there has been a transformation in the sense of, um, I would say again, like uh, ten years ago, there was a a, a vision that uh, was still much more rooted in the sort of national uh, framework, right? So um, uh, these exilic materials uh, were then sometimes perceived as not you know, not Chilean enough, right, or not dealing exclusively uh, with Chilean, therefore not a priority, and for understandable reasons too, right, because when you have, if you have a National Film Archive that's created 15 years ago uh, in 2006, uh, and it's an archive, uh, if there is no National Film Archive uh, before that, that time, um, you know, the bulk of its concerns are, uh, you know, silent cinema. Uh, you know, uh, you know, preserving uh, you know films that are greatly endangered, or uh, also repatriating a lot of a lot of films, right? Because, um, and that's the other reason why I try to distinguish right between return and repatriation, because there is um, uh, the 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 collections of the National Film Archive have been um, uh, created. Uh, uh, Thanks to a series of repatriation projects, right? But those uh, the are are not uh, they pose different challenges than this uh, the specificities of these uh, of this exilic corpus, right? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, but I have you know over the years again I have seen um, uh, a growing interest, right? a growing interest, right, or a growing realization, right, that these films, uh, you know. Also uh, belong right, and that uh, they they should also be part of the efforts of uh, uh, you know bringing them back and uh, and 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 situating them within the history of uh, of, of Chilean cinema. And uh, you know what has explained that transformation? Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm not exactly sure. There there are lots of factors, but I think it is partly tied to again the emergence of um, you know, let's say the discipline uh, of, of, of film studies, which is something relatively new uh, in Chile. So again, for the past 15 years, um, uh, you know, people have been uh, uh, developing, right, new approaches to, uh, you know, to film history. And, and I think that has influenced uh, the way some of these institutions um, uh, perceive uh, uh, their uh, what their you know goals uh, are or how to look at this you know particular uh, corpus. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I would say um, definitely a more uh, an opening uh, in, into the, the materials. There was. Yeah, Randy. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just trying to think about the, the idea, sorry, it's not a film question, <laughs> but the idea of exile um, and kind of building connections between our world today where there are so many people yep. from around the world yep. in yep. so many places. And, you know, thinking about um, what was Sweden or other, you know, places that were uh, welcoming people and creating opportunities for artists you know, what was the thinking about that? What can we learn from that? But also maybe, yeah, just any thoughts on the idea of kind of exile, which I don't think we hear this word so much now. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I think you know, that that's a, a, a great question. And it, it also uh, it goes back to this, um, to this idea of activating, right? In the sense that uh, there is, um, uh, Obviously, we live in a in a in a very different kind of uh, of globalized world right now. But there are still, I mean, uh, 
there are lots of you know political refugees um, uh, and exiles uh, in, uh, in in different parts of the world. In in addition to uh, various other forms of of migration, right? And it is true that the word yeah you want to. What about the difference between exile and refugee? What's well, that, yeah, that's a, 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 dif a, a difficult question because I think there's, um, you know, th there are the the sort of official ways of answering these uh, do not uh, have never really, uh, you know, captured uh, the uh, some of the. Uh, the complexities of the of the lived experience, right? So you can be a lot of you know um, a lot of Chilean exiles, uh, you know, were refugees in the sense that they you know formally applied for asylum and they were giving refugee status, right? Uh, other people, uh, you know, uh, some people were expelled from the country with the prohibition of returning. Therefore, you know, you're you're an exile in you know formal terms. But the majority of the people. Uh, Left because you know they felt their lives were in danger, or their you know family, their their lives of their family members or friends were in danger, uh, or they you know they left because they you know they couldn't stand uh, living uh, under the dictatorship for many 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 reasons, right? Or later they left later, right, in the early 1980s, perhaps for economic reasons, right? But how can you? fully separate, right, those economic reasons that would turn you into, let's say, an immigrant, right, uh, from uh, the, 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 politi the political conditions, right, that determine those economic uh, limitations and so on, right? So I think, you know, those, uh, the boundaries between those categories are uh, more fluid than, uh, you know, what the textbook, uh, let's say, UN uh, definitions uh, 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 say right, so uh, that's something that I can say about that, uh, and and I do think uh, that that's another of the uh, another very important uh, sort of political potential of these films uh, today, right? Which is how uh, to think of a uh, of a larger uh, you know history of of migration and forced uh, you know political displacement, right? And there are. Uh, you know many resonances between uh, you know some of these films and 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 the films uh, many you know migrant communities are you know making uh, uh, are making today. Right? Yeah, in a way, uh, Jose, uh, our countries also share a history of uh, coups and violence and uh, also exiled uh, filmmaking. Uh, I was also thinking when we talk about returns and for all the research that you have done. I'm wondering if you encountered any uh, collections or archives that were under embargo. F uh, for example, in the case of Turkey, there are still, um, it's not quite possible to imagine returns because that would, imp I mean, put some people still, might put some people still in danger. So therefore, a lot of collections are closed. Um, so have you encountered um, instances like this? Is it a sensitive, does it remain a sensitive issue in Chile's case as well? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I, I have not encountered uh, that case in, in, in the sense of uh, certain materials that could be sort of officially embargoed by uh, certain uh, institutions. But uh, it, uh, well, it certainly happens uh, regarding uh, certain classified paper documents, right, that have, you know, that are, yeah, classified and that, you know, will be open, for instance, from the documents from the commissions of uh, torture and so on, uh, 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 you know, are closed for the next 50 years and that kind of thing. But that's not really uh, connected to, uh, to film. But I do, if I, you know, uh, uh, the way some of the, Individual, for instance, filmmakers, and this is something that I know you wanted to ask at some point in terms of, you know, beyond the official archives, right? There's a lot of sort of informal uh, archives uh, and collections, I guess, you know, informal collections that people have that have valuable materials. Um, uh, filmmakers uh, holdings being uh, being one of them. And I think uh, these, um, for some filmmakers, right, these, um, yeah, are not necessarily, you know, Things that they uh, uh, want to be, uh, uh, you know, talking about um, or uh, or screening even uh, and uh, and so on, right? So um, I think dealing with um, 
uh, the individual cases of how, uh, yeah, different people uh, perceive the value of their own holdings, right, uh, mm -hmm. is uh, is a tricky is a tricky issue too. Yeah. yeah, and and so I was thinking it's not that they are sort of like doing a kind of self embargo, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, perhaps you know I can think of a couple examples that maybe you know that's uh, the case for you know one or two films. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have time maybe for one last question. So I'm looking at the audience. Um, or comments, reflections on the films that we just saw. No? <laughs> um, then maybe I want to ask one last question. So what are, what are your further plans? For example, are you planning to look at audio archives or maybe look at more smaller municipality archives, personal collections, maybe what are, what are uh, further plans for your research? Yeah, I mean, personal archives uh, involving, uh, you know, filmic materials and, and sort of different kinds of paper documents uh, tied to uh, these films. Uh, you know, for sure, and uh, I and my colleagues have been, uh, you know, doing that for, for, for a few years uh, in, uh, you know, depending on, you know, the kind of access that we uh, uh, gain. And again, you know, a lot of people, uh, due to uh, the travels, right, of exile and so on, have, you know, have lost a lot of their, their materials, right? Um, uh, audio uh, and sound archives, uh, I think uh, you know. You asked me what are my plans, and uh, you know, uh, my 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 uh, initial uh, you know uh, the the res first response that comes to my mind is you know I, I want to do other things, uh, and and you know there there are other other people uh, again you know going back to your initial question you know this is not this is not my uh, you know it's it's for others to uh, you know to do uh, and to continue the work and and do whatever you know they want to do uh, with these materials. Uh, I have uh, uh, dedicated already, you know, uh, 10 years, I would say, of, of my life, and I need to finish this book. And once this book is done, uh, and and once, again, you know, uh, I, I will always be interested in uh, sort of like recirculating these materials and doing programs uh, and those sort of things. Uh, but looking, I mean, rate. Uh, you know, sound radio archives is just a whole other huge thing. And and in all of the, you know, not all, but in most of the archives that I've visited, you know, the large archives like, you know, the INA, the Institut National de l'Audiovisuel in France, or, or uh, uh, the National Library of Sweden, right, they have you know, just enormous amount of uh, of sound records, right, that have to, you know, uh, radio programs, uh, uh, you know, uh, musical albums, right, that you cannot, you know, find, uh, you know, anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, for instance, uh, you know, we talk about films as a kind of, um, as a mode of epistolary exchange, right, between filmmakers in exile, also letters, obviously, but, Audio tapes were, uh, you know, a fundamental mode of communication uh, for exiles, right? Uh, so the Museum of, Human, of Memory and Human Rights has, has a lot of those. Um, again, other people are doing, you know, that kind of work. It's uh, very much important work, uh, but uh, it just opens a whole other uh, universe, and um, that that I hope, uh, you know, other others will, will yeah. work on that. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I think your work provides a great, uh, you know, um, almost map, like a message to how to study, how to research all these transnational dispersed uh, exilic uh, uh, films, and, but other, uh, you know, audio, other forms of audiovisual heritage. So uh, please join me thanking uh, Jose Miguel uh, again. Thank you so much for oh, your thank you. wonderful Thanks presentation. You. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, see you in the next This Is Film sessions. <laughs>